Hi everyone, my name is Majid Namazi and I am a PhD student at Griffith University. I am going to talk about surrogate assisted optimization for traveling teeth problems. Traveling teeth problem is a combination of two interdependent MP heart components including traveling salesman problem and knapsack problem. In this problem items are scattered over the cities, a thief makes a cyclic tour through the cities. Using a collection plan the thief collects items into the knapsack. The knapsack is rented and the knapsack has limited capacity. As the items are placed into the knapsack, total profit increases and total weight increases, but speed decreases, so the traveling time and the total renting cost increase. TTP goal is to maximize total profit and minimize total renting cost. So objective value is computed as total profit minus renting rate multiplied by total traveling time. Cooperative TTP solvers include methods such as CoSolver, CS2SA, and COCO, which stands for Cooperative Coordination Solver. In these methods, whenever a TTP instance is given initially a heuristic called chain link carrying on heuristic is used to generate an initial cyclic tour. Then the generated tour is processed by generating an initial collection plan. Then um, TSP solver and KP solver functions are called in an interleaved form to improve the generated solution and solve the TSP and KP components of the given problem. If there is not any improvement on the given uh, solution and there is enough time, the whole search restarts by generating another initial cyclic tour. However, we found that for similar initial cyclic tours in these methods, the final objective value does not vary much. So the overall search for TTP involves redundant exploration of the solution space and a subset of initial TSP tours will often lead to poor TTP solutions. Our proposal for these issues is applying a surrogate model for filtering out non-promising initial cyclic tours. As shown in this figure, after generation of any initial cyclic tour, it is given to a surrogate model and the surrogate model predicts final objective value which means the final objective value if the given tour would be processed uh, if the predicted final objective value is promising then the given tour can be processed otherwise it is uh, filtered out as a non-promising initial cyclic tour the proposed surrogate model is based on support vector regression and it acts in four phases including initialization, training, testing and applying phases. This figure shows these uh, four phases with um, potential transitions between them. In initial, in initial phase, the given TTP instance is sold for a number of restarts to generate initial training data set. Then in training phase, the final objective value values in the training data set are, are min-max normalized. Um, then the training data set with normalized objective values is given to the SVR engine for, for training. The trained SVR engine can approximate normalized objective value, which means ng hat in this formula for any new tour. Uh, the kernel function k in this formula is a customized Gaussian radial bas basis function that measures the similarity between two tours. Finally, the approximated final objective value g hat is computed by reversing the minimax normalization on ng hat. In testing phase, the given TTP instance is solved for another number of restarts and in each restart, the normalized error value is computed and the mean squared normalized error value is updated as a moving average uh, measure using um, this formula. The SVR engine is retrained in this phase whenever a new minimum or maximum final object value is obtained if the, or if the MSNE value as the accuracy measure of the trained SVR engine would not be acceptable at the end of this phase. In applying phase, the surrogate model is employed for filtering of non-promising initial tours as expected and uh, the for this purpose, the maximum tolerable error value or MT is considered to be beta multiplied by uh, square root of MSNE, where beta is a hyperparameter. I will talk about this beta parameter in the experiments section. Any new tour is considered to be processed more if ng hat is uh, larger than or equal to 1 minus MTE. 
otherwise it is filtered out either when is uh, when ng hat is smaller than minus mte or with a probability as shown in this figure if ng hat is smaller than one minus mte this vr engine in this phase is retrained if required as in the testing phase or more new tours are encountered for more details please uh, see the paper in experiments uh, we did a comparative evaluation between coco solver which is our proposed state-of-the-art ttp solver uh, with um, coca sm which is the same solver with the proposed surrogate model both solvers were run on http instance 10 times in each time both solvers were run for 1000 restart with the same initial tours experiments were performed with four different values for the beta parameter in computing mte or maximum tolerable error value benchmark instances were put in three categories a b and c being simple moderate and difficult to be solved each category has 32 instances with a range of about 600 to with more than 7000 cities this table shows results for the case with beta equal to 2 the first column shows names of the instances and the next three columns show uh, average percentage of the filtered out tours for each instance in each category and the last three columns show the number of missed based solutions for each instance in each category out of 10. This table continues in the next slide and as you can see in the last row of this table around one third of the tours are fil filtered out but the uh, average number of the missed best solutions overall instances is um, less than one tour which means less than 10 percent the next slides the next three slides show results for three categories this is for category a this is for category b and this one is for category c here these four points show performance of our proposed method uh, with four different values for the beta parameter based on average number of the missed best solutions out of 10 in y-axis against average percentage of the filtered out initial cyclic tours uh, in the x-axis and, and this uh, dashed uh, diagonal line shows the potential performance of a randomized uh, filtering method as you can see in all four configurations our proposed uh, surrogate based filtering method performs much better than the randomized uh, filtering method However, when we decrease the value of the beta parameter from 3 to 0, the number of the filtered out tours increases, but it comes with the cost of uh, losing more best solutions. Our aim in this research is to bring down this blue line and points down as much as possible, uh, which means filtering more tours and at the same time losing less best solutions as conclusion we have proposed to incorporate a surrogate model for for, for the cooperative ttp solvers to increase the efficiency of the search by pruning the non-promising starting points the proposed surrogate model based on svr or supports vector regression with a custom kernel adaptively learns the characteristics of initial tours leading to good ttp solutions it detects and disregards non-promising initial tours experiments on benchmark ttp instances show that the proposed surrogate uh, approach uh, removes a considerable considerable number of non-promising initial tours at the cost of missing a small number of the best ttp solutions if you have questions please contact me at the given email address thank you
Hello and welcome. My name is uh, Ralph Salman and I am going to present an extended abstract contribution to this conference called Branch and Bound for the Precedence Constrained Generalized Traveling Salesman Problem. Uh, the work is co authored uh, with my colleagues Fredrik Ekstedt and uh, Peter Damaske, and uh, a more complete version has been recently peer reviewed and published in Operations Research Letters for those who are interested. I am sure that many of you are familiar with the asymmetric traveling salesman problem, where one is required to find a shortest tour in a directed edge weighted graph. In this variant, the precedence constrained generalized traveling salesman problem, or PCGTSP, the vertex set is partitioned into several subsets, or so called groups. We are then required to visit exactly one vertex in each group. Furthermore, there may be precedence constraints, which dictate that some subsets must precede others in the directed tour. These are usually formulated through a separate directed graph, where an edge PQ means that group BP must precede VQ in a feasible tour. The reasons for studying this problem is that it arises naturally for many applications in the manufacturing industry. There are many processes which require an efficient ordering of tasks, which can be performed in several different ways. Moreover, there may be some partial ordering imposed on the sequence of tasks because of purely physical constraints or other process specific reasons. Our main contribution in this work is a novel branching strategy for the GTSP together with an adaptation of a specialized pruning technique first proposed by Shubaki and Jamal in 2015 for the non-generalized case uh, of the same problem. So rather than branching on edge variables, which is quite common for TSP variants, uh, we branch on group order. Every tour is required to begin at the starting group, V1, so this is the only group that is fixed at the root node here in the branching tree. Every branch then corresponds to a choice of which group to visit next. So for example, uh, sigma1 here contains the group sequence v1, v3, while sigma3 contains the sequence v1, v3, v6. The branching tree node n of sigma represents a PCGTSP subproblem, where the tour is required to begin with the group sequence defined in the sequence sigma. So for example, n of sigma 3 corresponds to a, a subproblem of the PCGTSP where uh, any feasible tour must begin with the sequence v1, v3, v6. The optimal choice of vertices can then be decided uh, easily and efficiently by dynamic programming for any fixed group sequence. There are two main reasons for using this branching strategy. Firstly, the number of groups is naturally much smaller than the number of vertices and vertex edges. A group typically contain, contains around 10 vertices, but uh, can contain as many as hundreds of vertex choices. So the size of the branching tree is uh, severely limited by this strategy. Secondly, uh, it turns out that we, we may divide the set of branching tree nodes into equivalence classes based on the principle of, the, of, the principle of optimality for the TSP. There are on the order of m times 2 to the power of m such equivalence classes or subsets, which together define a partition on the whole set of branching tree nodes. More specifically, we say that two tree nodes are equivalent if and only if their group sequences are such that they traverse the same set of groups and start and end on the same group. For example, if sigma i is v1, v3, v6, v5, and sigma j is v1, v6, v3, and v5, then the corresponding tree nodes n of sigma i and n of sigma j are equivalent. Then it turns out that we can exploit some properties within these equivalence classes. For example, we know that within an equivalence class, the tree node which corresponds to the group sequence with the shortest cost of traversal is the only one that can belong to an optimal branch. So if we store the smallest cost discovered so far for each equivalence class, we may directly prune any tree node we come across uh, within this equivalence cl class with a higher group sequence cost. Furthermore, it turns out that if you define the subproblems at the tree nodes in a certain way, we must compute the most cumbersome part of the lower bound computations at the tree nodes 
uh, only once per equivalence class. We tested this algorithm on several synthetic and real-world problem instances with a time limit of 24 hours. Uh, we found that the largest problem instance that was solved had 50 groups and hundreds of vertices. The scaling for large numbers of vertices is in general quite manageable. Uh, while the pruning method we describe in this presentation is powerful, the different methods for computing lower bounds uh, that we have evaluated are quite weak. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that the precedence constraints are almost completely relaxed in this part of the algorithm and are quite difficult to incorporate. Uh, lastly, in industrial use, the situation often calls for several robot, robots or workers to complete a set of tasks together as efficiently as possible. So there is a need to extend this work to the multiple agent case, which is of course uh, more complicated. Thank you for listening.
Hello, my name is Sean Seyrev. I'm a master's student in Ben Gurion University. This research is called Solving the Watchman Route Problem Optimally on a Grid with Heuristic Search. This is a joint work with Tamir Jaffe, Margarita Lopatin, and Ariel Fellner. In our problem, the goal is to find the shortest path inside a grid in such a way that we can see all the free cells of that grid. The input of this problem is a grid map and an agent's starting location. The output of the problem is a minimal cost valid path. A valid path is a path that after traveling it, the agent has seen the whole map. You can see on the left picture that the agent is starting at the left bottom cell and the solution is presented as red arrows. The movement of this agent is up, down, left or right, meaning four-way movement. Line of sight, Bresenham loss or Bress loss, a function commonly used in computer graphics. You can see at the right picture the agent marked as green and the gray cells are the cells that he can see from that location. To solve this problem, we use heuristic search. So now we'll define the problem as a search problem. A node is defined by the current agent's location and the list of all the cells that has been seen by the agent until now. We call it scene list. The operator is moving the agent to a neighbor location and adding to the scene list all the cells that can be seen from the new agent's location. The start node contains the agent's starting position and the scene list contains only the cells that has the line of sight to that location. A goal node has a scene list that contains all the free cells of the grid map. Notice that the agent's location can be anywhere on that grid map. To solve this problem, we use ASTAR, a best first search algorithm, and we develop three heuristics. Our heuristics are based on a graph constructed from the grid map. Our graph contains three types of vertices that represent cells from the grid map, pivots, watchers, and the agent. The pivots, colored red, are a set of cells which are not in the scene list. The watchers, colored yellow, are the cells that have line of sight to any of the pivots. And finally, we add the agent vertex, colored green, to the graph. The graph contains edges of two types. The first type are the edges between a pivot and its watchers. Their weights are zeros. For the second type of edges, we connect any pair of vertices which are not pivots with the weight of their true distance in the grid. For the pivot set, we choose cells which don't have any shared watcher. To simplify the graph, we keep only the frontier watchers. Those are watchers that the path from the agent to them doesn't pass through another watcher of the same pivot. As can be seen in the example, C and F are pivots, A, I and E are watchers, and V and H are left out because they are not frontiers. A path on this graph that contains all the pivots is a lower bound to our problem. So in order to compute our heuristics, we use the MST, minimal spanning tree, and the variant of the traveling salesman problem, TSP, which has a known starting location and the path isn't a cycle. Using four-way movement and these heuristics is our first method, which is called basic expansion. We developed a second method, which changes the operators. Instead of using four-way movement, we say that the agent can move only to the frontiers which are connected to it at the graph. For example, I, E, and A. When generating a new node with this operator, the agent's location is updated to be the watcher's location, and we add to the scene list all the cells that can be seen when traveling that path. We call this jump to frontiers, or JF. The bottom picture and the table next to it show our experiments on a grid map with a size of 11 on 11. For this experiment, we used four algorithms. The first is BFS, a blind search, and the others are based on ASTAR. Singleton is a basic heuristic that we used and the two graph heuristics mentioned before. The left column shows the basic expansion and the right one shows the jump to frontiers. As can be seen, the TSP heuristic performed best. Also, jumping to frontiers significantly improved the results. Overall, when using TSP and jumping to frontiers, we can improve the results by three orders of magnitude. The full paper for this research was accepted in ICAPS 2020. Thank you for listening.
Hello everyone, my name is Alejandro Arbelaez. My name is Laura Clement. And today we are going to be talking about our paper, Transition to E-Buses with Minimal Timetable Disruption. Uh, this paper is part of our project uh, Smart Electric Buses and we got funding from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. And we are both working in UCC, University College Cork, Ireland, and in the School of Computer Science and Information Technology. And basically, in this, in this work, we are going to be addressing some of the main uh, challenges that we have in order to move from regular diesel buses to uh, electric buses. For example, one of the most popular problems that we have is that we have a maximum driving distance. In electric buses, we can go, let's say, around up to, we can drive up to 200 kilometers without recharging, which is one of the main constraints that we have in this transition. And in order to show this, here we have a very simple image where we have two lines, two buses lines, one in dark blue and the other one in purple. Here in red, you have the common bus stops. Uh, one of the solutions that we could obtain, it would be this one. If you have a look here, there are some bus stops that are highlighted in yellow. In these bus stops, uh, we will be placing this that appears here in this picture, that is a fast charging station. And a part of providing where do we have to place the, the charging stations and how many, we also have to uh, specify for how long the buses are going to, to recharge. And as you can see, we can place the charging stations in individual stops or in common bus stops. In order to do that, we develop a mixed integrated linear program with three objective functions. The first one, the most important, is minimize the number of charging stations. Why? Obviously, for economical reasons. The second one is minimize the deviation time. And this is a very important part of this paper because we want to minimize the disruptions from the original timetable to the new uh, timetable that we provide with the implementation of electric buses in order to uh, satisfy the, the customers and don't have many delays uh, in the arrival of the buses. And the third one is minimize the number of charges done. And this is basically in order to preserve the uh, life of the batteries of the, of the electric buses. There are a couple of constraints here divided in subgroups. The first one is the constraint that ensures the capacity of the batteries of the buses, because basically we have to ensure a minimum capacity for reaching from one stop to the next one. The second one is the arrival time to the bus stops constraints. Basically here we want to compute when the bus is arriving to the next stop according to how long was charging in the previous uh, stop and also how long it takes to arrive from one stop to the other one. Also the, in the installing charging units. Basically here we are going to decide where to install a charging unit and the deviation from the departure time in order to minimize this objective function. We will also uh, include some non-overlapping constraints because we have to ensure that two buses are not charging in the same charging unit in the same time. Uh, basically, in the evaluation, we evaluate the, the model, the MIP model, we use CPLEX, and we use, in the experiments, we use uh, Ireland as a case uh, study. Basically, we focus in three main cities, Cork, Galway, and Limerick and we uh, computed the, the solutions for some of the main roads in, in the main lines, main bus lines in, in, this, in these cities. And we also tried different configurations, for example, increasing the size of the, of the batteries. Okay, because, for example, for small cities, a small, a small battery is going to be enough, but for bigger cities, we might need a bigger capacity. And all the uh, results are in the paper, but quickly, uh, quickly speaking, basically, uh, depending on the, of course, depending on the configuration and the city, we need uh, the fast charging stations that we need, it goes from one to seven uh, on average, and basically the, the delays, the, the delay from the original timetable stop, time table in, time table, uh, stop time goes from two to five minutes on, on average for, for, all the, for, all the, for all the experiments. And in the future, we want to explore more complex uh, alternatives to solve the problem. For example, now we are using, we try to solve individual objectives, so we try to solve the first objective, and then the second objective, and then the third objective. In the future, we want to get, we want to use more complex optimization techniques in order to get the, the Pareto frontier.
And we also want to uh, try to introduce, for example, uh, uncertainties because this is, uh, this problem, uh, the, the public transportation introduces a lot of uncertainty. For example, uh, there might be delays because of traffic or other situations. And thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.
Hello, I'm Ji Hee Han. I'm going to talk about our work toward the strengthening approach to path smoothing on grid graphs. Our work is mostly motiv motivated by that grid graphs are angle limited, where the agent is only allowed to move in a fixed number of directions. So the resulting paths usually have unrealistic looking due to unnecessary heading changes in free space as the result path length is often longer than the ones in a continuous space. This problem can be mitigated by smoothing the path in a post-processing step or by interleaving the smooth, smoothing with the search, which, which is any angle path planning, such as zeta star. But zeta star is typically slower than A star performing a frequent line of sight check during the search. So in this paper, what we aim for is to obtain the path in blue in a given a input grid path. We use the A star's shortest grid path as an input grid path and implemented the path smoothing in a post-processing step. The concept here for path smoothing is a string plane, so we think of, uh, think of the input grid path as a as a piece of string and try to pull the path as tall as possible from star and goal vertex. So the output path is a tall string from star to goal vertex that is in the same homotopy class as the input path. So will be located between which obstacles that original input grid path moves. Our work is based on eight neighbor grid graphs where its cell is either blocked or unblocked, and vertices are placed at the corner of unblocked cells, and start and goal vertices are denoted as SNG, and line of sight check between two vertices is performed based on the modified Branson line drawing algorithm to see if the line segment is blocked. And the input grid path is given as um, a grid path uh, with the a sequence of vertices where the each vertex on the path is labeled in the order way in which they appear on the path. In this slide, we briefly introduce the existing grid path algorithm. It is basically removing the internal vertices by making a shortcut on the path. So, and then it is iterated over usually from star to goal vertex. The figure shows that the example of how it works where the input path is given in gray. The grid path, the grid path smoothing algorithm starts, starts from P1 and see if the shortcut is possible. So the, as a, uh, there is a line of sight check between until P5, the three internal vertices can be removed, but when the iteration reaches P6, then there is a no line of sight check, so we cannot remove P5. So the iteration we begins from P5, and there is a line of sight check until P6, so we can remove P6 again. This approach can reduce the path length from the initial shortest grid path, but it still shows that it is longer than the shortest path in blue and also contains the unnecessary heading changes in free space. So the objective of our string pulling algorithm is produce the shortest any angle path in the same homotopy class as the input path. We denote the output path as SP and also we define SP end and SP end minus one as the last and next to the last vertex on SP. During each iteration, it either appends a vertex to SP or truncate SP by removing the last vertex on it. About the a pending procedure, it happens when LOS check fails and we determine which vertex need to be appended to SP to make the taut and unblocked path. So in order to do that, we check the LOS between SP end and current vertex PI on input path, and then identify the set of blocked cell that caused the LOS check to fail, and also determine the set of candidate vertices to be appended to SP from those cells. For example, SP initially has the star vertex C1 as the SP end, and then we check the LOS between C1 and B3 initially, as there is a line of sight, so we move on to the next PI, which is B4. This line segment is blocked by these cells 
and there is a full number of uh, candidate vertices that can be added to SP. We choose one by calculating, calculating angle between um, P minus 1, which is B3, and SP end, and PI. And we choose, uh, based on these four candidate vertices, B3 has the smallest angle, so it is appended to SP. And when SP starts to turn in a different direction without LOS failure, then it is no longer taut and remove the last vertex from it to make SP taut again. In order to do that, we use a variable turn that keeps the kind of turn of SP, which is categorized in either left, straight, or right. For example, when B3 is appended to SP, the resulting turn of C1, B3, B4 is right direction, and it, it is recorded in the variable turn. In the later iteration, the current kind of turn here, this moment, if of uh, C1, B3, A5 is a straight, which is different with the one stored in the variable turn. So we remove the last vertex, B3, from SP. And then we keep iterating the, uh, by checking the LOS from, L, uh, from between uh, SP and C1 and also the PI here in A6. There are two uh, cells that cause the LOS check to fail and eight number of the vertices that can be add, added to SP. Uh, we choose the one based on the approach we mentioned earlier and there are two vertex B3 and A5 has the smallest angle as zero. In case of ties we choose the one farthest away from SPN which is uh, C1 here to keep the number of iterations small. So A5 is appended to SP, and then the goal vertex is added at the end of the iteration. So we conducted the comparative experiments with the original short script pass, which is A star without pass smoothing, and the A star with grid pass smoothing, and theta star. We consider 20 different types of maps from the moving AI repository and average the result over all instances and maps. The figure shows that the path from A star without path smoothing in gray and A star with gray path smoothing in dotted green and A star with a string playing in blue and theta star in dashed black line. In terms of path length, which is a given as optimality gap from the ANIA's shortest path, the theta star was so achieve the shortest uh, pass length uh, with the point one three percent, followed by string playing and grid pass smoothing and A star without pass smoothing. In terms of runtime, the shortest one was achieved by A star without pass smoothing, followed by grid pass smoothing and string playing, and then CSR star. In terms of number of heading changes in free space, the string playing achieved the zero number of heading changes heading changes in free space followed by theta star and grid path smoothing and A star without path smoothing. In this paper, we developed a new path smoothing algorithm based on string playing. It starts with an input grid path and put the input path as tall as possible. In, path, in experiments, the string playing algorithm finds the shortest path than the grid path smoothing while running almost as fast as it, and compared to theta star, our algorithm is can significantly reduce the runtime but obtains similar pass length. In particular, the streamplane algorithm achieved the zero number of heading changes in free space. This ends my presentation. Thank you.
Hello everybody and welcome to my presentation. This work deals with the efficient localization of faults, which is an important prerequisite towards successful debugging of systems. The definition is as follows. We have given a system which consists of a set of components and which does not behave as expected. And the goal is to find the faulty components responsible for the misbehavior. Let me give you a short example. Assume the following full error which does not work properly. In this case, the system description would be a logical characterization of the structure of this circuit and the nominal behavior of all the components, in this case, the five gates. Then we would have some observations, inputs and outputs of the circuit, in this case. Then, by means of theorem provers and the logical system description and the observations, we can make predictions, which could look like this. And if we find a contradiction between observations and predictions, then we know that not all components can be fault free. Then the task is to find the diagnosis, which is a set of faulty components. This is usually accomplished by means of conflicts, which are component sets where at least one component must be faulty. In this case, we have two conflicts, this one and this one, and we know that a diagnosis is then a hitting set of all these conflicts. In this case, we have three diagnoses, and the question is which one is the real fault? Let us next cast a quick glance at how diagnosis can be computed. One influential and popular algorithm for this purpose is Writer's HS tree, proposed in 1987, but still state-of-the-art in various diagnosis domains. Coming back to our example from before, we can watch a fast-forward execution of HS tree on this example, where we can essentially see that conflicts constitute the node labels of, each, of an HS tree, and there is one emanating edge for each component in each conflict, and finally the diagnosis are exactly represented by the edge labels along the branches that are labeled by the green checkmark signs. The trees constructed in breadth first or uniform cost order depending on the preference criterion imposed on the diagnosis. And another important aspect is that the conflict computation is expensive because it requires theorem prover calls. The pros are that it is sound and complete, it is best first, and it is generally applicable in that it is independent of the used system description language as long as it is a monotonic logic and independent of the used theorem prover. The sole con is that it has no provisions for being used in a sequential diagnosis scenario where additional information about the faulty system is acquired in order to isolate the true diagnosis among spurious other candidates. The issue then is that the diagnosis problem changes after each measurement. Let me give you some more details on the sequential diagnosis process. Given a diagnosis problem instance, we have the first module, which is the diagnosis computation, which builds some search tree, for, is, for instance, an HS tree. The output preferred diagnoses are forwarded to the second module, which is the measurement point selection, where usually some heuristics are used in order to find the best point where to make a measurement. Next, we have the measurement conduction step, where the oracle actually performs the measurement, which is then forwarded to the fourth phase, which is the knowledge update phase, where a new DPI is constructed from the current DPI by adding the new measurement to it. This loop is iterated until some diagnostic goal is reached, and finally the best diagnosis is returned. What is particularly of interest is what happens with the search tree in the phases four and one. If we stick to HS tree, then we can only pursue a discarded rebuild principle, which means that we discard the existing tree from the current iteration and build a new one from scratch in the next iteration, which however involves several redundant expensive operations in the general case. To this end, we suggest to use dynamic HS, which follows a reuse and adapt principle. And here, this would mean that we prune and relabel the tree from the current iteration and reuse it in the next iteration, uh, which should minimize uh, a whole lot of redundancy that we incur with HS tree. And in this vein, dynamic HS also answers a long-standing question posed by Ray Reiter in his seminal 1987 paper. We've extensively experimented with both HS tree and dynamic HS using different random solutions to be found after a sequential diagnosis session using different measurement point selection functions, using different real-world DPIs, using different numbers of preferred diagnoses that had to be computed in each iteration, and we found that in all scenarios dynamic HS led to, to significant average runtime savings of up to 70%. And notably, this was achieved while retaining all desirable properties of HS tree. Second, we counted the number of single runs where, a, where dynamic HS was better than HS tree, and as the line at the top shows, we have in most of the scenarios a 100% rate 
uh, where dynamic HS outperformed HS tree. And overall, if we take everything together, then we have more than 98% of all the single sessions where dynamic HS was better. Finally, let me point you to the full paper that will be published in the Proceedings of EK20. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>